And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the... Ma the mastermind behind Adventure Conqueror King system, as well as Ascendant, and a and a bunch of and a bunch of other oh, a bunch of other OSR projects, and now retur now returning to the fray with By This Axe, the Encyclopedia of Dwarven Civilization, or Dwarfin, whichever you prefer. The one and only Alexander Macris. How you doing today, man? Hey, I'm really good. Thanks for. Uh having me yeah all right let me get let me get something obvious out of the way the title by this axe was were you trying to go for a call reference uh yeah absolutely <laughs> so it was uh, it was it was two things one it's king call the short story by this axe i rule mm -hmm. um and then two it's an it's a double entendre you know to purchase the adventure conquer king system yeah so um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I will, there's a, there's a bit of a, I'm not sure if I shared this with you before, but there's a bit of a joke that we have around here regarding dwarves and axes, since a lot of people have asked, why do dwarves wield axes when they live underground? The answer to that is quite simple. Elves live in trees. Yes. Well, so I actually, um, I actually answer that in By This Axe, and... Um, it originates from the fact that dwarves need a lot of lumber, um, both to fuel the forges and smelting um, that is necessary to process ore, uh, as well as for their mushroom farms. So lumberjacking is a major um, work of dwarves, uh, and they, that brought them into conflict with elves. So the first war that the dwarven people ever fought was against the elves, um, where elven archers started shooting at their lumberjacks. Mm -hmm. And so the lumberjacks defended themselves with the tools at hand, which was the axe, and so the axe became the symbolic of heroic dwarven resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, I should ask the obvious question. Of all the races to, to, fo to focus on, um, why dwarves? Uh, so, I had written a series of supplements for the Adventure Conquer King system. Um, I did a supplement on mining that was based on ancient Roman mining practices, mm -hmm. and everyone said, oh, that's, you know, that's so cool. You should do dwarven mining, you know, where they can delve too deep and stuff. And I thought, oh, yeah, I guess I could do that. And then I did a supplement on different types of farming, and everyone was like, oh, that's so cool. You should do mushroom farming. And I was like, yeah, I guess I could do that. And, you know, each thing I did, people were always suggesting these very dwarf-specific things that they'd like to see. So eventually I went to uh, my fan base and I said, do you guys just really love dwarves? And basically the dwarf was the favorite character race. So I said, okay, I'm just going to do a whole supplement about dwarves. And, um, and that's how it emerged. So it was really just like organic from the community. Mm -hmm. Now... In your in your estimation, now obviously the, obviously there's no one right answer to this, but just from your experience, what's the appeal with dwarves? I've got my own answers to that, but I'm curious your um, assessment. I think so. I, I was having this uh, this discussion the other day, and here's what I concluded. I think when you're in your 20s or your teenagers, you relate to elves because elves have you know eternal youth. The world is their oyster. Um, they, uh, you know, they have symbolism of dreams, imagination, you know, unlimited future prospects. Um, but your typical OSR gamer is actually a guy in his 30s, 40s, 50s. And I think when you get to that age, the dwarf becomes a race that you relate more to. You know, the dwarves have, have seen some shit. Uh, the dwarves are tough. You know, they get the job done. Uh, they'd like to just be left alone to get their work done, have a beer, you know, eat, eat a hearty meal. 
Um, and it, um, I think it just kind of speaks to a certain masculine trope, a masculine archetype um, that a lot of men today can really relate to. Um, and I, I think that's the basis for the enduring popularity of it. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, I'd say the, I'd say the other thing is, is not, is the fact that you look at a lot of you look at a lot of art and a lot of characterization with dwarves, and they tend to not be as highfalutin. I guess I'd say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. arrogant, yes, but high but highfalutin or or acting or acting like they're above it all, which is one of the key reasons why some why some people, including myself, don't like elves. Yep, that's right. But that's right. But, I agree. But it, dwarves it, are known for their brutal honesty <laughs> dwarves dwarves are you know they're they're your they're the equivalent of like the working class uh uh you know blue collar hero mm -hmm. um you know you know uh and i think also and this is funny but you know i think your average gamer looks a lot more like a dwarf than he looks like an elf you know like go to my gaming group every single guy there has you know a big burly beard? Half of us have beer guts. You know, um, ain't, ain't ain't nobody that's got uh, a wavy wavy build with perfect blonde hair and purple eyes. <laughs> you know, like... No, the I think the only reason I don't qualify is because I'm too damn tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. But. Then again, I remember I remember integrating the Goli the Goliath race, just so just so I could have a tall dwarf. <laughs> yep, yep, that's basically what Goliaths are. That's right, they're tall dwarves. Oh, uh, but now take now taking taking all that in mind when writing it as a as a cyclopedia, um, was the was the goal to be as system agnostic as possible, or was this originally written as a axe supplement? Um, so it's not intended to be as system agnostic as possible. It's primarily written for axe, and then it's secondarily written to be easily compatible with any game that's built on the same framework that axe is built on. Mm -hmm. So that's Labyrinth Lord, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, uh, Old School Essentials, uh, Redbox D&D, D E C M I D and D rule cyclopedia D and D. Mm -hmm. You could also use it with basic fantasy RPG, uh, Swords and Wizardry, or Osric with some modification. But yeah. the sweet spot for it is definitely the group of games that descends from the Molde Red Box. Mm -hmm. uh, now, with with that in mind, I know that. I know that Axe itself has its has its own setting that leans far more into the Mediterranean. Um, mm -hmm. Was was how easy or difficult was it to integrate that when a lot of a lot of the dwarven um, archetypes are far more are far more northern end of end of uh, Europe. Yeah, so what I did, as I said, there's two Dwarven cultures. There's the Dwarven culture of the Jutlandic Mountains and the Dwarven culture of the Miniri Mountains. And, um, and I used that as an opportunity to um, allow for different types of Dwarves. The Dwarves of the Jutting Mountains um, are more Germanic and um, have, uh, you know, more horned helmets, um, you know, rune-covered, uh, warrior, berserkers, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then the dwarves of the Miniri Mountains um, are more cosmopolitan, and they are more like steampunk dwarves, um, reminiscent of some of the steampunk technology that you see in uh, World of Warcraft, for instance. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you could loosely put it that the Judding dwarves are Tolkien dwarves, and the Miniri dwarves are Warcraft dwarves. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, uh, I do find it kind of amusing that you that you reference Warcraft dwarves because a in a lot of o in a lot of OSR circles, there seems to be this 
almost un almost unwritten rule or so or something like that that we're not supposed to be taking inspiration from video games, which I find kind which I find kind of laughable given um, history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't worry about it in the slightest. Um, what I did is I made a list of all of the tropes I thought were cool for dwarves, mm -hmm. um, and then I essentially reverse engineered what dwarves would have to be like physiologically and psychologically in order to justify those tropes. Yeah. So, so for instance, um, in the book, some of the things I talk about are um, that there are two dwarven men born for every dwarven woman. Mm -hmm. And so dwarven women are simply rare. And also dwarven women can only gestate every 10 to 15 years. So dwarven children are rare. So that's why, you know, the dwarves are always having population problems. They're always getting, they're always losing to overwhelming numbers of kobolds and goblins. That's why you don't see dwarven women very often. Mm -hmm. um, the dwarves are, you know, more physically resilient than, than humans, which is why they're capable of mining so well. Um, because uh, ancient mining practices were incredibly toxic, and the average lifespan of a miner was only five years, but dwarves are tough enough that they can handle it. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, a major element is that dwarves live a really long time, but they're not ageless like elves. So a dwarf will be an old man for longer than an entire human lifespan. And so um, when you then think about that, what that means then is it's a society that's run by and for old men. And so what is a society like that? Well, it's traditionalist, it's hidebound, it's conservative, um, it's pragmatic, it's not very emotional, and those are all traits you see on dwarves. At the same time, it's also earthy, you know, a little bit of a dirty old man, carousing element to it, which again, you see in dwarves. So, and then I explain, where does the steampunk come in? Well, so because dwarves live longer, they have to have better memories to be able to maintain memories over a longer period of time, so they're able to learn more knowledge, so that's able to make them a little bit more technologically advanced. And unlike humans and elves and kobolds and whatnot, they have severe population pressure, manpower restraints, that make automation worthwhile for them. So, you know, the Roman Empire, they never needed automation. They had millions and millions of people. Um, they had idle hands, you know, you just built the roads by hand. But if you figure the dwarves have constant population pressure, then all of a sudden it makes sense for them to be more steampunk, to be more industrialized. Mm -hmm. um, and then I prevent the Industrial Revolution from, um, you know, blending into the rest of the world by basically um, having it be that it, it doesn't rely on easily accessible stuff that most people can get. Only the dwarves can really mine it, and so it, it just can't spread beyond dwarven civilization. So there's no danger of an Industrial Revolution in your game setting. Yeah. So, you know, so that's an example of how I basically took the tropes and then I came up with um, justification for it, you know, explanation for it. Which, in my temple, we approve of that since we've, um, unlike unlike some who feel that who feel that the ne they need to get away from tropes, despite the despite the fact that getting away from a trope for its own sake is just self defeating. Um, we've always we've always said that tropes are like paint on a canvas. People can use it. People can use the paint well, or they can use it poorly. But if they use it poorly, don't blame the paint. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Now you've mentioned you've mentioned six racial classes that you that you have that you are going to have for for it, and I'd like to go through each to kind of get a feel for the. Gen for the general idea, the general play style of each class, I know that there's some moving parts because of because of some of the systems within within Axe, but there's still at least a general leaning we can go with. Yeah, so the Dwarven Volgard is the dwarf from Red Box Dungeons and Dragons. He's a fighter. He's tough. He's hardy. Um, and. Uh, you Didn't know, the Red Box Dwarf have some thief skills? Does the Vault Guard have that as well? The uh, Red Box Dwarf did not have thief skills. Oh, what so. he had, what he had, was the ability to detect sloping passages and um, underground apparatus, and he had um, hear the ability to hear noise better yeah. than ordinary humans. Yeah. But they weren't, but they didn't improve with level the way thief skills did. Fair. All the dwarves have. Yeah, all fair. the dwarves have that. Yeah. 
Fair, fair enough. I um, when you have when you have to do when you have to juggle like five different versions of the same game in your head, some things get crosswired. Totally, totally. <laughs> so, so that's the that's the dwarven bulk guard. Mm -hmm. Then there's the dwarven delver. So the dwarven delver is a um, an explorer of the subterranean world. He fills a niche similar to the thief, although he's not per se a burglar. He's more of a treasure hunter slash explorer. Um, you know, he has the ability to um, function well in darkness, uh, you know, hide, sneak, um, you know, climb walls, detect traps, backstab, etc. Uh, then there's the Dwarven Craft Priest. So the Craft Priest is the equivalent of the Cleric for Dwarves. Um, unlike Clerics, uh, they have spell books, prayer books, and they have to record their spells in prayer books study them, etc. So they are similar to mages in that regard. And the idea is that the dwarves don't pray to the gods, they pray to their own ancestors whose divine power is accumulated in the relics of their great works. And so the prayer books are the incantations of those particular, um, of those particular reliquaries and those particular ancestors. So each dwarven craft priest is a little bit unique in what his spell selection is, unlike a cleric of a god who always gets the same spells from their god. Mm -hmm. um, the dwarven craft priests also begin as experts in a particular craft. So, you know, you might be a, a, a weapon, a weaponsmith, an armor, etc. And axe has full rules for that. Um, then there is the dwarven machinist. So uh, the machinist is a steampunk creator of mechanical devices that are pseudo magical. Um, you start off with one, your, it's called your personal automaton, and that can range from a jetpack to a motor vehicle to, um, you know, some sort of handheld gadget to a man portable ballista, things like that. And then the technology ranges from, um, you know, clockwork robots to steam powered cars to zeppelins, etc. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole system in the game, a very elaborate system for designing your own, which is which is very fun. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the Earth Forger, which is a type of dwarven magician, but he doesn't use arcane magic. He manipulates the ancient magic of the Earth itself, and so he's able to shape Earth as if it were clay, basically through concentration and devotion. Um, powerful class, but very rare. And then finally, there's the dwarven Fury. Uh, who um, has uh, is a dwarf who, for whatever reason, has become houseless, has become um, uh, filled with rage, desire to die, and so um, he carves flesh runes on his own skin that make him immune to normal weapons and sort of wades into battle in a berserker fury. Mm -hmm. um, so they're obviously inspired by the Warhammer tropes of dwarves yeah. as compared to the Warcraft uh, automaton tropes. And they fit in well with the jutting dwarves. So those are the six classes. So yep. you know, if you, if you wanted to be, um, you know, if you want to emphasize the mystical, runic elements, you know, you've got earth forgers and you've got furies. If you want to emphasize more the steampunk elements, you've got machinists and delvers, and um, you know, or you can kind of blend it all together into a, go a gonzo mix. Mm -hmm. And now, with that, with that in mind. When it comes to earth, when it comes to earth forging, which you refer to as a new style of magic, um, I'd be cur I'd be curious what the rules of that style of magic would be. Is it st obviously it's st obviously it's still using spell charges, but beyond that, what would some of the rules of this style of magic be compared to normal mages? For the earth forgers, yes. Yeah, so the Earth Forgers only get one type of invocation instead of multiple spells, and they pick that when they create. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, an invocation of fire, there's an invocation of earth, etc. And they, um, and then as they level up, the invocation becomes broader in what it can do. Um, and they are, so imagine having like one really kind of broad utilitarian spell with a bunch of different sub-uses that you unlock over time, rather than uh, a menu of spells. Um, so, you know, for instance, if you take a, a first level Earth Forger, you know, he's going to be able to um, shape a wall of stone, he could push a, an opening into a sealed wall, um, you know, he could fling... Uh, a stone into a target, 
Um, but he's going to have absolutely no power with charms and illusions, and that, all that's going to be totally closed off to him. So it doesn't let them really replicate what a human or elven um, mage can do, but within their, within their area, within their element, they're very powerful. Yeah. Given, given the fact that it's that level of hyper-focus, is it still using the Vancean model? No, it's not. It's not. Huh. Yeah, because I was about to say, having having that kind of focus while also having the limitations of the Vanzian model might be a bit too restrictive. So the way it works is each time you use the magic, mm. um, you decide how long you want to spend doing your invocation, and it can range from 10 seconds to 6 hours. Um, then you make a throw to see if you succeeded on the invocation. Mm -hmm. If you fail, then you get a point of stigma, which is you know the stigma of failure. And when you accumulate enough stigma, you lose access to your magic until you purify yourself. Yeah. Um, and then if you uh, succeed, then you get to just keep using your magic without problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Squeaky chair. Oh, you heard that in the background? Sorry. Yeah. That. <laughs> uh, now, when it comes to auto automatons, the idea of building... Um, machines in this regard there's there's a whole lot of directions that that can go so i'm curious i'm curious how you would have how you'd have the building of dwarven automatons work within this system so what you do is you decide whether it's uh you know a vehicle an object um or a device you then allocate a number of hit dice to it and special abilities and then you spend the special abilities to add various properties. And then you can also take uh, drawbacks, which are negative abilities um, that reduce the cost or open you up to have more special abilities. And special abilities can be the ability to move, the ability to have an operator, the ability to carry passengers, um, having a, a protected compartment, um, having various magical abilities, being able to attack. Um, and then you can then uh, layer the special abilities on top of each other. So like once you've purchased the ability to move, you can then add the ability to fly, the ability to hover, the ability to go underwater, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's basically, it's a point build system. Um, and, you know, we built everything from, as I said, from, you know, uh, clockwork automatons to gigantic battleships and zeppelins with it. And it's super fun. And it's been really carefully tuned, um, to work within the uh, axe uh, economic system. Um, you know, I didn't want a situation where, because of automatons, it just triggered an industrial revolution and you know everybody was in battleships. So I was very careful uh, to, to make it all work correctly. So they need fuel and they need maintenance and they need crew. And you know, if you're busy maintaining your automaton, you can't build a new automaton, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all very, it's all very nicely balanced. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, when it when it comes to when it comes to them, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that there's a set of you already have a few exa a few example vehicles, but is there essentially a t essentially a template for for cer for a certain des for certain designs to build off of? Um, I mean, we provide about thirty designs in the book that you can build off of, and some of them are stripped down and simple, so they're and literally say like this is a base design that you can add to. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's just that when it comes when it comes to something like this, there's a ba there's a balance that should ideally be taken because on one hand you on one hand you don't want it to be too simple and have a lot of designs feel kind of samey. On the other hand, you don't want to deal with choice paralysis by making it um, mechton levels of freeform. Um. Yeah, it's not quite Mechton levels of freeform, but it's it's close. I really liked Mechton, so that was actually yeah. inspirational to me. Um, I would say the difference is that in Mechton, it's so freeform that you're actually creating the components of your mech as well as creating your mech. Mm -hmm. um, and in this one, you're creating your mech, but you don't have to build the components. We pre-built the components yeah. for you. Um, speaking of which, it's only a matter of time before somebody makes somebody makes a steampunk a steampunker clockwork mech uh, um, through this system and puts their dwarf in as the pilot? Absolutely. We actually provide one. We call it the War Titan, and there's another one called the Siege Colossus. Yeah. Either that or so, either that or somebody's going to make a motorcycle. 
Uh, there, is not a, there is not a motorcycle, but there is a motor cart, like a, a, four -wheel, a four wheeled ATV. I just, I'm just saying it's a matter of time before somebody goes crazy with the concept because you know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, for sure. I want it to happen. <laughs> yeah. And now when it comes to domains, obviously the, obviously the domain system is one of the, is one of the big signature aspects of, of Axe. Um, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing you're going to be expanding the domain rules to, give, to allow it to have a more dwarven flair. Yeah, the domain rules are completely, uh, you know, revised for more dwarven flair. You can have dwarven mushroom farms. You can have dwarven mines. Uh, you can delve your mines deep into the earth for uh, to get bonus riches, but risk encounters with, you know, that which lurks below. Mm -hmm. uh, you can engage in experimental mushroom farming, where you, um, you know, uh, try exotic new varietals, which can, you know, create superhuman dwarves, but also create kobolds or mutations or zombies. Um, so there's just tons of delightful stuff in the book. I think anyone who enjoys the Axe domain system will enjoy um, what I've yeah. put together. Now, when it comes to mining, um, I get, I because of the fact that you mentioned delving too deep, I'm, guess, I'm guessing there's some event-based abst abstractions, but I'm curious how you do that. Um, so what happens is that the mines have a capacity, and when you've used up the mine's capacity, a human miner has to stop mining, but a dwarven miner can continue to dig, and it's called delving too deep. Mm -hmm. And um, every time they delve too deep, they make a roll on a chart, and uh, with a bonus based on how deeply they delved. And um, eventually, bad things start to happen. And they can be bad things like, oh, we've hit the water table and the mine is flooding. But they can also be bad things like, oh, shit, we opened up you know, a gateway to hell and ball rocks just came through. Um, and it really depends on how you roll and how deeply you delve. So it's an increasing risk return. Um, but you know, on the other side, by delving, you can also gain access to you know diamonds and mithril and you know mysterious minerals and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. And now, when it, now, we've talked a bit about mushroom farming throughout this. I think it. I think it's a good good spot to go into detail what that is and how how big how big of it is for for dwarven culture. So, okay, so with mushroom farming, I wanted to answer the question, why don't we see farms surrounding the dwarves? Like, what do they eat? And I did some research and I discovered that you can create mushroom farms with no sunlight, um, very little water, um, but you do need wood pulp. And so, the, and we already knew that the dwarves were lumberjacks and had fought with the elves, so it made sense that they would use their um, organic refuse and their wood pulp as the the substance for their mushroom farms. And, um, and it turns out that in a relatively small area, you can grow an enormous amount of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And so if about 20% of the population engages in mushroom farming full time, they can feed all of the other dwarves. So it's a very, um, very, very productive type of farming. Um, it takes a lot of wood, so the dwarves are always hungry for cutting down the forest um, around their domains. Um, but it produces a lot of food. Now, what's interesting is that it produces a lot of food that's really, um, it's very high in vitamins and minerals. It's not very high in calories, and so you need to eat about 20 to 30 pounds of mushrooms a day to survive. Mm -hmm. um, presumably some of it in the form of um, mushroom beer. But I thought that explains why dwarves have such giant appetites, um, because they're used to eating 20 to 30 pounds of food a day from their mushroom diet. So then they go out into the human world and they have huge stomachs, um, you know, and they get given, uh, you know, a pound of bread like a normal human would eat for a meal. And it's like, what is this? This is, you know, this is, this is 5% of my, of my daily mass of food. Um, and of course, if they do eat 20 pounds of bread, then they'll get very heavy very quickly. Mm -hmm. hence, the, hence the whole thing with dwarves being fat. So, yeah. so I, had a lot, I had a lot of fun working on it. I also learned how to mushroom farm when I was researching the book, which is pretty funny. So now I know how to mushroom farm. And, well, there's, al there's always been the, 
has always been one of the one of the stories when it comes to Norse berserkers that they that that they would eat certain types of mushrooms in order to get themselves well high as balls. <laughs> yes, in fact, and so we have ten different there's ten different types of mushrooms in the book um, that have various pseudo magical powers, and then there's a proficiency you can learn called dwarven brewing that lets you make them. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. now. As I understand it, a lot of the book is written in a in-universe style, as presented by um, by Sir by Circanius. I do apologize if I mispronounced yeah, it. Yes, Circanius of Cipheron. Yes, he's our he's our resident sage. Yeah, I created this character. Um, he's kind of like a combination of a Herodotus or Diodorus Siculus, mm -hmm. so uh, an ancient historian, combined with a really snooty Victorian. Um, who thinks that he's very open-minded and fair and objective, but of course is you know filled with his own biases, and um, and then many of the things that you read, you're you're left having to read between the lines to understand the actual dwarven culture, um, because Circanius doesn't quite get it. Like he doesn't understand why all of the machinists use hexadecimal math. Um, that's converted into ones and zeros, and he's like, I, I, this is just bizarre to me, and I don't understand why the Moors would use a number system like this. But of course, it's because they're using, you know, they're programming automatons, so they need to have uh, a system that easily converts into binary. But you know, he, that completely eludes it. But anyone who's a computer programmer who reads that section will get a good laugh out of it. Um, and then, you know, there's tons of tons of funny stuff when. Um, you know, he, uh, you know, tries to learn how to translate Dwarven um, and discovers that, uh, you know, everything in Dwarven is in capital letters because Dwarves only say important things, so why would you ever use lowercase letters? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Now, in, and of, cor of course, I can't, I kind of got the Victorian thing with the, with the, um, head, with the headings of on the, Blank, which is definitely how a lot of old manuals are, are old manuals are written. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I read a lot of those those things and, and took inspiration from it. So, um, you know, anyone anyone who's ever read old old writing will definitely get the vibe. Um, but unlike them, I think there's more a lot more sense of humor uh, in it because we're reading it. You know, from an ironic distance of knowing this is a fantasy race, mm -hmm. and so it's uh, it's pretty funny. Um, but like, for instance, you know, the dwarves because they have two men for every woman, they've had to come up with different marital arrangements, right? Um, you know, so they have like all of these dwarven, um, all these dwarven bachelor brotherhoods, like you know, fraternal organizations where the unmarried men live together, and um, you know, so it's like. The, here's our Victorian scholar trying to very delicately ask, you know, what, but without asking, he's trying to find out, well, what do they do, you know, to relieve their fury and interest, you know, and the dwarves are like, well, why don't you join a brotherhood and find out, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's good fun stuff. Yeah. And you mentioned, you mentioned taking inspiration, a bit, a bit of inspiration from the Warhammer style dwarves. I'm curious, I'm, because of one of the relic items that I saw on the Kickstarter page, I'm curious if you took the concept of grudges as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the Warhammer concept of grudges. I think gr I think honestly, Warhammer most took grudges from Tolkien. I mean, yeah. the Tolkien dwarves had tons of grudges. So I, 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 and and in turn, Tolkien took it from Germanic and and Nordic myth, where the dwarves held long grudges. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think grudges are an important part of. Um, uh, Dwarven culture, uh, and it goes back to as I said, the dwarves have really long memories and really long lifespans. So you know they might they might forgive, they don't forget, and um, you know when you have uh, a really long time, you know you you tend to lean uh, towards um, you know more of a, a a revenge or a cold kind of grudge, and so you see that in the world. Mm -hmm. I also have I also have a. a according to the dwarves, that um, laws are written in stone. So once a law is passed, it can never be changed. And once an oath is sworn, it can't be undone. And if you don't fulfill your oath, it passes to your, it passes to your descendants. 
to an active end facility. So, um, so you can be like, you know, a third or fourth generation scion of a dwarf trying to fulfill an oath one of your ancestors made. So the dwarf, the, the dwarven grudges are intergenerational. Yeah. And I do remember in one in one setting that I that I had written, they don't where I had had it that 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 whole lineage thing is carried over in the fact that you don't have you don't have last names and said you inherit the name of each of each of of each um each each dwarven father or mother that came before you so some some um, people can have names that can go long yeah that's right that's right there's there's tons of stuff like that in the book it's very um it's very rich with flavor and you know as a game master you can use what you want one of the virtues of writing it in character is that um, the, the GM can always say, well, the scholar was wrong, or he got it, you know, he misunderstood, or this was only specific to that one clan he was talking to. So you can still use it in any setting without having to worry that you agree with everything. Just toss out the parts you don't like. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to, as far as far as I as far as I understand, this is the this is the first time that you've ever written a supplement specifically on a. Sp on a fantasy race, oh, since a lot of the other supplements that you've done were on a specific style of fantasy, or so, or something in between that, or just a more or a more general idea, um, what what kind of things did you have to change in your in your particular style to adapt to that? Um, to adapt to writing, I don't think I quite understand the question. Um, Writing about a specific race versus, as opposed to writing in a general sense. Oh, I, I, it was easy. I mean, essentially, I split the writing into the in-character writing and the rules mechanics writing. The rules mechanics writing was no change at all. Um, I just wrote game mechanics and presented them. Um, the uh, writing for um, the lore, you know, that took some adaptation because I had to develop a narrative voice for Circanius. Um, but once I kind of developed it, I could hear it in my head, and so I just would sort of sit down and channel him, and it, it was fine. It was kind of like having a co-writer, um, and, uh, you know, and a, kind of a co-writer was a snooty asshole, and so, um, I would, like, quote, discover things about dwarves and then transmit them through Circania, so, uh, it's kind of a fun experience. I think, um, I, I had a lot of fun writing from the point of view of a fictional narrator. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as far as a total page count for the thing? I know that that might change because of some of the stretch goals. Yeah, right now it's at two hundred and ten pages. Um, I think it could end up, depending where the stretch goals come in, it'll end up somewhere between two ten and two fifty six. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't, I, I can't see it getting much bigger than two hundred fifty six. It'll probably come in two twenty. Yeah. And for for me personally, I hope I hope that the because I saw some of the stretch goals and a bunch of character classes. I hope th I hope those end up get getting unlocked in one form or another. Yeah, I hope so. Um, some of them would be really really fun to unlock: the excavator, the spore collar, the furnace wife, etc. We'll yeah. see. You know, it's really it's always really hard to predict um, how you're going to do at the end. You know, we're going to hit thirty k in the next day or two. And um, that'll be, you know, that, that'll get us through all of the relics, and then we'll be moving on to the class bonus goals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would not be surprised if we hit 40K. Uh, I would be delighted if we hit 50K. Anything above that is just pure gravy to me. So I do think we'll get some bonus classes in the book. Mm -hmm. And with that said, what are, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, well, the book's written, so um, it's just a matter of art and layout. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I usually say one year from when I get the when I get the funds, um, and that's uh, because it can take a while for uh, nowadays for printing and shipping. Um, you know, to print a full color book, you have to do it overseas. There's, you know, McNaughton Gun that I used to use for black and white books doesn't do full color printing in the U.S. And anything overseas now is taking ages to ship because of all the shipping crisis. So mm -hmm. um, I think, I, you know, the book will be done um, and ready for people to read the day it funds. 
Um, and then from there, it'll be first an art free PDF, and then the PDF with art, and then the book itself. Mm -hmm. And with, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to, to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Yep. And any time you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. That's right. So... And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!